At supper, I felt, which I always do here, I'm with good people. I'm with happy people and hopeful people. And these are difficult times. These are not easy times, not easy to be hopeful. There is in the climate that we live in a lot of raging anger, a profound, it's public. People feel it. I have many friends who say, I just can't watch TV anymore. I just don't want to listen to the news. What's happening in the States, what's happening here, it's difficult. And the climate is changing, not just environmentally, but socially and politically. And we'd have to be blind not to say there are deep divisions that are felt uh, in meetings of town councils, in schools, boards of theology schools, sports, towns, the Vatican, the conflict between progressives and conservatives, to the point where at this time of year, Thanksgiving, there are always articles in the newspaper, how to get along with your relatives at the turkey supper. You know, don't speak too loudly, don't say this, don't, don't say drum. It's there. And I think that every one of us feels very sad about this when we think about it, the kind of conflicts that we feel with each other, with our families, in the institutions of church and government that mean a great deal to us. And the answer, I think, is not, let's just stop listening to the news or like Catherine Deneuve, the actress, uh, changing her moisturizer. In that ad for second debut, she says, if you can't change the world, change your moisturizer. <laughs> you know, so the outlook is bleak. Uh, don't watch TV and change your moisturizer. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are realities and worth thinking about. So I want to begin by just sharing a personal experience that has helped me think about the particular time that we're living in. And it has to do with my experience of living at Romero House in one of four little houses in a little neighborhood of a very large multicultural city. And it was here that I first had a kind of profound insight into the meaning and the necessity of thinking about the common good, not about what divides us, but by what draws us together. So a little bit more of a context. Uh, I was part of a small group that got involved with refugees and then started Romero House about 28 years ago. And we chose this particular neighborhood because it was a no-name neighborhood. Nobody wanted to live there. The stockyards were close by. There was a stench. It was a dead and gone neighborhood and cheap. So we moved in there. And as we began, we uh, had a very profound sense that we wanted to welcome refugees in a different way. We didn't want to be social workers and clients or landlords and tenants. 
we wanted to live with refugees. And I'm saying live with, not uh, be in an office where refugees would come and see you. That we would live in the houses and that we would relate to one another as neighbors. And we would invite refugees to become neighbors, to begin to shed that feeling of always being categorized as refugees, as people with problems. So that was our ideal, to live in the houses with refugees as good neighbors. But we never thought about the other neighbors. And the particular street that I lived on, live on still, is known by the hokey name of Wanda Road, as in fish called Wanda. And some people visit today and say, where are the fish? Uh, we, I did not know any of the neighbors on that street, and there were 10 other houses. And at that point, I was just simply too busy to even want to know the neighbors. But they knew us, or they thought they did. And so for the first year that we lived on that street, and these women in gorgeous African dresses would walk down the street from the subway, they would be sitting in their houses watching. And this state of being strangers went on for about a year until we decided to renovate the garage, a coach house in the back of the house. And we decided to do that so we could repair the furniture that people donated to us. And any of you that have been involved in real estate will know if you try to adjust your property, you have to go to a committee, right, Paul? Okay. And ask for permission, which we did. And then, to our shock, at the meeting of the city council, on the Committee of Adjustment that regulated repairs, a group of 40 neighbors marched down to City Hall with posters, banners, and stood up and gave speeches that if we were allowed to renovate that garage, it would be drug dealing and prostitutes and all kinds of people, there would be a 10-story building in the backyard with peeping toms everywhere. And there was so much hatred in the room. It absolutely took my breath away. And those of us that made the presentation got together and had a small meeting and said, we simply can't proceed with this application. There's too much hatred. We cannot invite people into our houses knowing that they're going to face a mob who doesn't want them there when our whole point is to welcome people. So that was, I would say, a dark night for me. And I would walk up and down the street in the early mornings, and I would look at the houses, and many of them were inhabited by Eastern Europeans at that point. And I started to think in racist language, did you do it? Was it them? Was it the Eastern Europeans? I could see myself beginning to reflect the very thing that had been so hurtful. And into this dark night, social night, came two neighbors, uh, one of whom 
had just moved onto the street who had little kids. And I told her what had happened. And I said, we're probably going to be moving out pretty soon, as soon as we can find another neighborhood. And I told her what had happened. And she said, look, we can't solve all that. But Christmas is coming up. And let's have the kids in our house make hampers for the kids in your house. We can do that. And so we said, good, that's great. And then on Boxing Day, I got a little stronger and sent an invitation to all the neighbors, come and have leftovers with us. Only three people showed up, but I thought it was an improvement. And then one neighbor threw a little barbecue. And there were more people who came. And then over about five years, uh, slowly we be began to know all the neighbors on that street. But it was a very slow process. And what I learned is that most of the books on community organizing never really communicate the amount of time it takes to bring about significant change. It always seems, you know, you go into a neighborhood, you organize, and things change, and you go. And it doesn't work that way. It's much more long. It's small. It's little things, like a refugee from Colombia offering to shovel the snow of a very cranky older man who had been one of the people who had gone down to City Hall. And he came out when she was shoveling the snow and said, why are you doing that? Do you want to get paid? I'm not going to pay for you to do that. And she said, she was a lovely young woman, she said, I no want your money. In our culture, we respect the old. And you are old. <laughs> and he said, oh, I see. And that same winter, I remember, we had bought a snowblower with some of the other neighbors. And I was on the finishing off my job. And I thought, OK, he doesn't have anybody to help him. He's looking after his older mother. I'll just do his driveway while the machine is still working. And so I plowed his driveway. And he came out and said, the same man, well, that's a nice thing to do. And I said, yes, actually, I'm a really nice person. <laughs> and so are all the other people in the house. They're actually really nice. He said, hmm, OK, all right, and left. So to make a very long story short, after 10 years, some of the neighbors said, let's do something positive. Let's have a street party. Now, my idea of a street party is a few barbecues, the radio up, and hot dogs. And he went out. He was Portuguese. And he got arches that covered the street, and lights, and, and uh, bands, and parades, and it was absolutely fantastic, to the point where now that street party usually has about 500 people who come to it. All the neighborhood, not just the street. And they're proud of this effort. So somehow, we came together. And it's not a perfect community. Many problems. Every year, somebody fights with somebody. It's like a weeding a garden. You have to keep 
at it in small ways every day. But something good has happened. Now, when we were in the middle of this huge conflict, I would call it a time of darkness when we honestly didn't think we could last in that neighborhood. I remember one day sitting on the porch and just looking out at the street and saying, what can we hope in? We don't have anything in common. We don't have a language in common. We don't have religion in common. We don't have a culture in common, values in common, nothing. What hope can there be? And then, I'll never forget it, but it was like all of a sudden I saw what we had in common was the street. The space, like there are five houses on one side of the street, five on the other side, but in the middle is the street. And it's the street that we share. The street that nobody owns, but we are all responsible for. We're responsible for keeping it clean. This is the simplest level of neighborliness. Buy their garbage, you will know them. <laughs> Get your garbage out. Make the streets beautiful. Plant flowers. Sweep the streets. Have parties. Check on the elderly in the street, the ones who don't come out of their houses. Ask how they are. Where are the kids? What are they doing? We all together, I realize that we had discovered a common good. That was the street. Now, there's a lot of discussion today about the common good belonging to those who have a shared sense of values, who see things in the same way, who are the same. I heard one politician speak the other day saying, vote for somebody who looks like you. They think of common as sameness, but everything changes when you begin to say, this is the space that we share that is bigger than any of us and smaller than any of us. So it started me on a path of really seriously thinking about the common good as something we so desperately need at this time in our culture, in our country. We need to know, we need to experience, to believe that we can hold something in common that is greater than the divisions that are so obviously apparent. And it's, it's not enough just to say, let's agree to disagree. That's nothing. What we need is to be able to say, we do share something in common. And what does that look like? And how does it happen? So looking back over the history of the common good, in Greece and in Rome, in the time when people debated in the forums of the classical world, and in the medieval period, the common good was actually something that existed. It existed in a space, the commons, where citizens would begin to discuss and debate together. 
And the interesting thing is Dave Hollenbach, who is a Catholic theologian, who's actually written a lot on the common good, he said what's interesting in the classical and medieval theological writings is that although the notion of the common good is central to Catholic social teaching, there's hardly anything written about it in an extended way. And he asks why, but doesn't answer the question. But I'll carry it one step further. One of my colleagues at Regis College is an expert in the documents of Vatican II, Meg Lavin. And I said, Meg, where have you seen the common good referred to in Vatican documents, the documents of Vatican II? And she phoned me back and said, there's only one sentence on the common good in the documents of Vatican II. Although it is assumed, it's presumed, it is the foundation of much of our social thinking. So this, I began to wonder, what's going on? And I realized that very much as I was able to look at a street and see a space opening for something called the common good, that's exactly what has happened throughout history in the classical and medieval period. That people in the medieval period, for example, in the monasteries, in the small towns, every one of them had a space that they called the commons. It was the space where mar the market was set up. People bought and sold. It was where people got married, where there were celebrations, where there were parties, where the local ruler would come and speak. So people in those cultures had a physical experience, a daily experience of what it meant to, to live within and around a physical sense that we share something in common. And that space is not something that anybody owns, but we are all responsible for it. And then we find historically that <coughs> in the 18th century, especially in England, was the beginning of the growth of the enclosure system. So people began to buy up chunks of the land that until that time had been shared in common. And so people looked on that space and no longer said our good that we hold in common. The owner would say, I own this. This is mine. I own this. And it's the beginning of, you know, the, the long history of the mercantile conception of things and people. And there's a very well-known political thinker, C.B. McPherson, who coined the phrase possessive individualism with the rise of industry and capitalism. People began to speak of spaces as something that you own, as people that you could own them, that you could own yourself that you could have colonies that you owned. Everything became subject to ownership. And with that is lost the profound sense of having a good that is held in common. Now I just want to ask Victoria if she could flash up
a poem on the screen. Okay, I, want, I think this poem, uh, more than anything that I can say, illustrates the profound spiritual challenge that's involved in thinking about the common good and our place in the world. And it's by Margaret Atwood, you know, who actually writes poetry, not only dystopian uh, novels. <laughs> she did just win the Booker Prize, by the way. But this is one of her early poems. And in it, she describes a moment when you begin to think of the world as something you own. And the minute you do that, you lose it. You lose the goodness and what is held in common. So let me just read it. The moment when, after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this, is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave, and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor, time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belong to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. So you see, you know, this thing of ownership, that's not just about private property and it's not just about banking. It's a real, it's a spiritual attitude. And if you begin to think of your room, your house, your country, as you own it. The minute you say that, parents know this about their kids. The minute you begin to think of your kids as what you own is the minute when you will lose them. That desire to control, to own the possessive individualism. And so I think that in a search for a common good at this time, uh, we, we're not talking about reorganizing politics or anything like that. If we think about it deeply enough, we're talking about a whole spiritual attitude, a way of looking at the world that isn't about owning and controlling. It is a way of recognizing that what we have been given is a gift, that we could never organize or build or so on. And so how wrong of us to say, okay, I am the center of this. I did it. I own it. The minute we say that, or we say, this country, we own it. This church, it's ours. We're the ones who've got a right to speak. We are the ones who say, who can live here and who can't. The minute we think about our church, our country, our families, with that sense of possession and ownership, we've lost it, and it's gone. So I think 
for our country, and I'm going to use a large country, our challenge spiritually is not how we should be a great country, but how can we be a good country, a good and just country that we don't own, but that we are responsible for. Now, I think to build these kind, this kind of country or to build a church that is maybe not great, not imperial, but a good church, we need a special way of relating to each other. And then going back to my image of the street, we don't need people to love each other the way you love in a family. We don't need that. We don't need people who think of other people as just citizens or political persons. We don't need people who think of others in professional ways. They're a social problem or they have this to contribute, or that to offer. Somewhere between a kind of loving, romantic way of relating to other people and the faceless, nameless way that we think about others in our church and in our country, in between those extremes, is the way of relating to each other as neighbors. And I've begun to see at Romero House what a difficult task it is to learn to relate as neighbors. We say this is the constitution of the church, love your neighbor. We say that the story of the Good Samaritan is the constitution of the church. The theologian John Sabrino has said that. We need to learn how to relate to people, to other people, in a way that's not too close, but also not too far. And when we start, started Romero House, and we said, we want to live as good neighbors. I think we were right, but we had no idea what we were talking about. And maybe after 28 years, I'm starting to say, we need to think about what it means to relate to people as neighbors, not as people that we love. You don't have to love neighbors as you do your family but you need to care for them. You need to know they're there. You need to respect them. And you need to see them. The way we treat people as just political entities, that doesn't really help us to see what's really going on. And if we go to the story of the Good Samaritan, we see a man going down the road, another man going down the road, and they don't see the man by the side of the road. They don't see because they're not close enough. To be a good neighbor means you're close enough to see the good and when something doesn't work out. So the Samaritan sees, and then he acts. He brings him to the inn. He says to the innkeeper, here's some money. Look after him, and I will be back. And note that he doesn't put him on his donkey and then stay with him for the rest of his life. He takes him to an inn. He gives him to somebody else where he knows he will be cared for. 
And this, I think, is crucial because it means being a good neighbor does not mean having to do everything. But it does mean doing something. Take them to the inn. Take them where someone else can then look after them. And I can see in the people who volunteer at Romero House and myself that we are all learning this delicate, important, life-sustaining way of relating to people that is near, so near enough to see there's an old lady in that house over there whose son is an alcoholic, and it means she's not getting anything to eat. You see that. And then you do something. Not everything. You know, we can't take the place of family, but being a good neighbor, doing something because you've seen, is crucial. It's a way of being, a way of being good with one another. And this neighborliness, living side by side, is what helps us not want to possess the street, not wanting to control people on the street, but wanting to be responsible. The common good begins when we realize that we don't own the street or the people in it. We don't own the country or the church or the city. We don't control it. But we are all responsible. And I've seen so often in the uh, volunteers who work, come to work with us, they want to help, they want to be responsible, but they also have to learn the limits of neighborly love. And so many well-intentioned people struggle with boundaries. You know, what is the boundary of helping? I'll just get burnt out if I try to help everybody and do everything for them. But being responsible, I think, is possible only when we begin to say, this person is also in God's hands, not just my hands. And I think that's the most profound uh, basis of neighborly love, where you can genuinely care and be helpful. But you don't have to set up boundaries, like you can't come in tomorrow. You have to know for sure you're not the only person caring. God is also caring for this person. So we are learning and together on that little street how to be responsible, not too much, but not too little. And that love of neighbor is inherently tied to the belief that we are all held in the love of God. So let me return to just some things I said at the beginning. Our challenge right now, all of us, is how to live well in a mean and angry time, very mean and angry. And the very minimal we can do is to say we'll tolerate differences. But that's so minimal. And it's not the kind of thing that gives life to a church or to a country or to a community. Because what happens when there is nothing 
held in common is that we begin to look for a common enemy. And we see lots of that today. That groups and individuals who have lost a sense of who and what they care for are held together by who and what they're against. That's what's dangerous. And what happens when you're held together by that, by hatred, by a sense of enemy, the danger is you become like what you are fighting against. It's a horrible thing to see. If you look often enough at those you consider to be your enemies, you will begin to mirror them within yourselves. So our spiritual challenge is, in this mean, angry time, how to live well, how to live with a sense of goodness and care and responsibility without having to create enemies. And so in this, with this question in mind, and I'll, I'll close with this, um, I turn to Wendell Berry, the Appalachian poet and thinker. Some of you can see heads nodding. Some of you know who he is. The New York Times has called him arguably the prophetic voice in America today. I think because he has been able to communicate the primacy of being located in a place and beginning to see your part not as the one who owns the world, and controls it, but to see yourself as inhabiting a certain place and space of finding your rightful place as a human being. So he has written very beautifully about a small community close to his own called Port Royal uh, which has a sense of neighborliness. And it's the kind of neighborliness that grows with certain public virtues, and they're quite different from what is often articulated as a public virtue. Um, humility. We are not the center of the world. Loyalty, forgiveness, compassion. These are the virtues of a community grounded in goodness that has a sense of the common good. Now he goes on in some of his writings to point out that this way of being is not just about local communities. It's about each person finding a ground of goodness that will enable you to live with the larger search for the common good of the cosmos of the environment, of the climate, of large cities, medium cities, institutions, schools. And he's saying that why he writes about this little town called Port Royal is he is saying it is here in this little place that I know what is the good that we hold in common? It's always precarious. It's delicate, but it's there. And he says, in this place, I know 
who and what I'm for. For him, it's crucial because he's very critical of his nation. The policies on war, the policies on agriculture. And he said, if I just think about my country and its policies, I can get very angry and I will then become what I am fighting against. I will not be able to bring goodness. But, he says, if I'm grounded in what he calls a beloved community, if I'm grounded there, I can be critical of the world that I live in. And there's much to criticize but I will not add to the enemy list. I will not participate in that. So let us try to imagine in these times, living in a country that we don't own but we are responsible for this little piece of earth, of living in this place, San Antonio, that we don't own, but we're responsible. This little piece of earth is what we care for and what we're called to be faithful to. Thank you.